Welcome to NASA headquarters. I'm Don Savage, Public Affairs Officer for the Office of Space Science. During a seven-day period this July, the periodic comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 will collide with Jupiter. I got a phone call from uh, Steven Spielberg saying he wanted me to come in to talk about doing a remake of the movie When Worlds Collide, a George Pal movie from the 1950s that I had remembered vividly and actually loved as a kid. And the George Pal movie was about two worlds in collision, but to me, we, we couldn't do that. And so I was trying to figure out what could this movie be? And I started remembering about the new research that had just been coming out about the fact that it appeared dinosaurs had been killed by cometary impact on the planet. And that to me was a very important idea. And I started to think, well, this could be the, the actual story, that it's not about another world on collision course with the Earth, it's about a huge comet coming in collision with the Earth. And I was very, very curious to know what would happen. It doesn't really take you know, something even as large as what we have here, even much smaller objects, like, for example, in 1908, when, the, when uh, either a stony meteorite or a, or a comet, a small comet, exploded above the Tunguska region of Siberia. That would have happened over Europe. There are estimates that depending on exactly where it happened, you could have wiped out millions of people. And then I went and started to sort of research this whole thing of the Shoemaker-Levy comet that had gone into the uh, planet Jupiter. And the first people I went to were Gene Shoemaker and Carol and his wife and David Levy. And we went up to Mount Palomar. Carolyn showed me the little slides that she had actually used to discover the Shoemaker-Levy comet. And we started talking. And Gene and I talked to four in the morning about a comet really coming to the Earth and what it could do if it hit. We're talking about 100 million megatons of kinetic energy, 100 million megatons. Now, uh, you know, that number is so large, it's hard, it's hard to keep it in mind. If you put all of that into one body or distributed bodies and hit the Earth with that, I think we're talking about an, the kind of event that's associated with mass extinctions of species on Earth. And then I tried to understand, well, how can we stop a comet that's coming at us? And I went off to talk to the people at, at uh, NASA, at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and they implied that really there is no way to stop a comet. We don't have the technology. And all these issues started to just swell up for me, and I became really fascinated by what if this really happened? Stephen and I talked about a three-hour movie, a really huge epic film, and tell the story of the people on Earth who were going to face this calamity coming at them. We have to deal with the president and his reaction to all of what's going on, to the news people who are going to be covering this story and beginning to realize that they're not just reporters but human beings caught in the drama of the whole planet. All of these stories were, were converging and they were all stories that meant something to me. David Brown, with whom I produced The Player, called me and told me about this, the, the, the project and I liked thinking about the end of the world. And what I liked about it was that the world really got hit. And as sometimes happens in, in, in a project this massive, I mean, a lot of movies are written by more than one person, particularly big, expensive, uh, technically complicated films. And this one was really just written by the two of us. Bruce did his immense amount of work and then had written a massive draft. He had absorbed a huge amount of information and research. They had files and files of, of detailed information on what exactly would happen. And also the reality of, you know, the, that there are preparations, there are protocols, there are files, cabinets somewhere in Washington, which describe what the government's response would be if something like this were to happen. And by the time I came in, the job was really to reduce all of the storylines, to trim them down, and to focus on a few of the characters and to stay on those characters, and then also just to keep condensing the, the scenes. When Deep Impact was brought to me, I was editing, I was in post-production, deep post on The Peacemaker, my first film for DreamWorks, and DreamWorks' first movie. And Stephen had come in to view the cut and give me a few pointers. And he turned to me and said, I've got this big sci-fi movie that I would love you to direct, called Deep Impact. And I said, well, I, I don't do sci-fi. I don't know anything about sci-fi. I don't, I'm not a lover of sci-fi movies. I don't follow them. Um, I don't know, I don't know if I could do that. And he said, you can do anything. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I didn't actually see any sci-fi movies in preparation and for this movie. Action. I had asked Xanik, who was my producer, 
he and David Brown, if they thought I should. And they thought it really wouldn't do anything for me. So the movie that I actually watched a lot in preparation for this movie was On the Beach. Uh, I loved uh, that feeling of isolation and the world coming to an end. And I sort of thought about that movie a lot when I was directing this movie. I worked a lot with Michael Tolkien on the characters, you know, just bringing the characters out more, arcing them more, um, defining them more. Among all of the characters as the script was put together, it was Jenny Lerner, the, the Taylorone character, who became the central figure for the story. And every storyline had to move through her and around her. Taylorone was a very fresh face and had been doing a comedy and felt that she hadn't been really seen a lot. So we started off with Taya Leone. And then it was actually Dick's inspired idea to have the president be Morgan Freeman, because who else on this planet could be our president <laughs> that we would so love and admire and trust? And Morgan Freeman has all those qualities. And then we batted around a lot of ideas about who the, who the astronaut would be, you know, who's the old timer? And, you know, Duvall immediately appeared. He's also someone who brings such wisdom and weight to anything that he does, and it's such a reality. Do you know the National Gallery is saving all of the art? They're shipping it to the caves. I've given them my beautiful 18th century desk from New England to hold a shirt in silver. I had the good fortune of working with Vanessa Redgrave, who, to me, can be anyone at any time. And um, that was an extraordinary experience for me. See, Mark? Elijah was, I think, just 16, and he didn't even have his driver's license. And he had to learn how to drive so that he could drive the motorcycle and drive it legally. And Lily had just turned 14. I think when I auditioned her to begin with, she was 13 and a half. And then when we started the movie, well, when I started filming her, she turned 14. And it was great watching these children evolve. And, you know, Elijah had been working since a child, uh, has, was a child actor. And he was a real pro. Uh, they both were. And, you know, working with children of that age, they're so open. They don't come to the set with too many preconceived ideas. They work rather instinctively. And that was really very refreshing. In, in my original conception, the Elijah Wood character was much more sexually aware as a young kid. He was much more active, and the, and the world coming to an end only intensified that with his girlfriend, who was even more precocious. And that, for me, was very uh, compelling as storytelling. And in my own version of the movie, it would not have been surprising for this character to run off and try to uh, find the girl that he loved. It, it is a huge love story, and he was already, in a sense, emerging from his childhood he had he had come beyond the cocoon of childhood just because the world had forced that upon him he was growing up very very fast just take care of yourself okay i'm gonna make it 